with Hashem's loving grace, we're happy to be back with another session of Likutei Mo'aran. Uh, we're trying to pick during the times of wartime, our particular Torahs that we could learn at once and give us a point of spiritual strengthening, what Rabbi Nachman calls itchaskut, uh, to strengthen ourselves in Amuna, strengthen ourselves in Bitochan, and this spiritual money in the bank. Before I begin, many people, I get emails and WhatsApps and messages about what's going on. And like uh, Rabbi Ari said, give a little update from an Amuna standpoint. There's one thing that Hashem is showing us. Hashem is showing us that uh, we, the those who seek him as Jewish children and as Noahide children, uh, those who seek him in truth, get no friends in the world. Uh, there's something today. It's a, a tremendous scandal. It came out. It turns out that CNN, New York Times, Reuters, and AP complicit with the massacre that they knew they had. They asked how what, how were they at 6:30 on the border taking pictures of Hamas breaking through the border and sitting even in the back of a, of a nukva, the 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 Hamas commandos, uh, uh, CNN photographer. Well, they're trying to deny it, this, but that they knew they had advanced knowledge about it. And you can see the media to make a story. It's okay to spill Jewish blood to make a story. And uh, I just don't, it, 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 I'm surprised, even surprised that the, the, the moral decadence of the West and the Western media that just goes to show that you just cannot believe them, cannot believe them. They're complicit in massacre and murder just to get a story. And, and then they de deny it. But uh, Israel's got proof. There's this proof of photography there. There's proof of uh, of even the the freelancers from from Gaza that work for the CNN, that work for AP, work for Reuters, but they're their own testimony. And uh, that's why we do a moon of news so we get the truth. The truth is right now that uh, it's like a noose closing around Israel. Elat is the southernmost point of Israel. It's in the Red Sea. It, it just got hit today with uh, missiles from long-range missiles from Yemen. These are called the Houthis, H-O-U-T-H-I. They are Iran's proxies in Yemen. Now, just understand the axis of evil, how thick, like a spider web it is. They've got the Hezbollah in Lebanon. They've got Hamas in Gaza. They have the Houthis in Yemen. And they, 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 there's ISIS was to the east of us, but the ISIS, meanwhile, uh, has been knocked out. But there's also Hezbollah, and there's Palestinian Jihad in, in, in Jordan and in Syria. In other words, we're surrounded by evil, surrounded by evil. And this is a spiritual war. If my ask in my humble opinion, uh, I see everything that's happening now. And Hashem wants us all to get closer to us. Now, if it were just here, that would be one thing. But if you see what's happening with the anti-Semitism in the UK, the anti-Semitism in America, where a 70-year-old pro-Israel demonstrator gets hit on the head, gets murdered, uh, it's knocked out. They have on film who the assailant was. He has not been arrested. Okay, that's a, he's not been arrested. Just so it's okay. America, democracy, land of the free. This is the same justice that CNN and Reuters and, and the left-hand left media. This is the mainstream media, the politically correct media. Anything political correct, political correctness, you have to understand, is the exact opposite of truth. It's the exact opposite of Amuna. It's the exact opposite of Shem's will. Political correctness is that people could justify what the Torah calls abominations, what the Torah calls crime. And it's th this is what this is a spiritual war. And we're preparing ourselves for the coming of Mashiach because there is no military solution. So what's going to happen? It, it, it's, it, 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 Israel's in a dilemma right now that they, if we go in and, and, and just make a massive attack on the tunnels, there's hostages down there. And there'd be tremendous, it's all booby trapped and at Gaza. There's there's still today in Ashdod, uh, we still had uh two sets of barrages, one at 10 o'clock in the morning, and another one later uh at uh in the afternoon, uh about five o'clock in the afternoon. And yes, yeah, so what are these to have the power to, to, to still fire us? Because they're still intact, they're underground, uh, plenty of fighters and plenty of terrorists and unlimited access to arms are all coming in. They flow from, there's tunnels from Egypt into Gaza, and that way Iran funnels in tunnels. And then naive Americans want to make, uh, you know, ceasefire, humanitarian ceasefire. And we have eavesdropped in 
uh, Hamas speaking to one another. Uh, the, the Hamas controls the ambulances, and they use the ambulances to tr- to transport terrorists around. And they're located in the hospitals, and they're located in mosques. And it's a very thing. The whole world is looking. The whole world is looking at uh, in public opinion. Oh, Israel bombs mosques. Israel bombs hospitals. Uh, let me tell you one thing. How come no one says anything about? Uh, uh, did anyone say when the the Americans bombed Dresden in World War II? make a humanitarian corridor for the starving Germans. Uh, when America dropped, uh, you know, the poor people in uh, Nagasaki and Hiroshima, uh, did they probably, almost, they weren't in the Navy in Pearl Harbor. Okay, but again, America uh, just completely wiped out a civilian population. I don't have to go back that far. What about my brother? My brother served in Vietnam and my brother came out of Vietnam with what they call yellow poisoning, that the America dropped so much napalm all over Vietnam, that the American soldiers themselves were exposed to that. And uh, I know I'm, it, it's all kinds. He's got to the derma, derma, dermatological problems to this day and, and muscle problems today, skeletal problems today, although from back in Vietnam. And America just wiped out jungles, wiped out. Where, where, was, where was humanitarian aid in Vietnam? I did never heard of a Vietnam terrorist attacking anybody in New York or in L.A. Over in Vietnam, and they did there and just wipe them out. Uh, we have to understand there are two levels. There, there, there are two levels. There's, there's this one level of morality of the world. There's one level of morality for the Jews. And a, a Jew is uh, a, a Jew is only good when a Jew is defenseless and when a Jew dies. And <laughs> that th- those days are over because uh, we're never defenseless. We've got a Shem. And that's our weapon. And our weapon is what we're going to learn right now. Right now, that, that's a quick update in the war. Sorry for indulging. But uh, one thing, this I I. I Free my attention. This is the closest people to me in the world, my family and the people on this lesson tonight, <laughs> last night. And uh, Bo Hashem, thank you for getting a, a little bit of a catharsis, Elise. Thanks for indulging. And uh, with that, we are going to open up a look at Moran to Torah 115. And Rebbe Nachman is going to elaborate on a passage in chapter 20 of Exodus. This flash of the chapter 20 of Exodus is when Hashem gives us the Torah on Mount Sinai. And I'll say it in the Hebrew and I'll translate it. Okay, the passage is Vayamod Ha'am Mirachok, Moshen Nigashel Arafel, Asher Sham Elokim. Rabbi Nachman makes his whole Torah 115 on this one passage. And translated it means the people kept their distance. They kept their distance. They stayed further back from Mount Sinai. And Moses went up and Moses went into the fog. It was like a deep fog, a mist. What do they call it? Deeper a mist is a, a fog is deeper than a mist, but like a fog, and that's where Hashem was. Hashem was concealed inside the fog, and Moses went right into the fog. Okay, this is the 18th verse of chapter 20, and you can look at look up yourself. Okay, so Rabbi Nachman explains explains the verse. There's so much deep. Like Rabbi Nachman takes one verse of Torah, and he elaborates on it, dissects it piece by piece, word by word, and gives us the deep, deep secrets. And the deep secrets are here that Rabbi Nachman will tell us what to do with our challenges in life, how to approach our challenges in life. Rabbi Nachman says, Okay, so we're talking about first if a person lives a material-oriented life. Look at most people in the West. Who thinks about their soul? Who thinks about their spirituality? How many people call spirituality? And if they talk about spirituality, it's some kind of funky spirituality that it doesn't obligate. It's not obligatory, and it doesn't make you have to change your morals, change your ethics. Uh, you know, start telling the truth, uh, stop stealing. No, it's a what they call uh, what they parlor parlor spirituality. You talk about the, you know those things and. You know, people talk about Kabbalah and mysticism and all this, but they don't change. They don't change. Real spirituality obligates us to change and to become better people. Because Rabbi Nachman says that if a person, he's been going and living a material life, and all of a sudden he sees a situation. This is exactly Rabbi Nachman's Torah. It is so prophetic today. And he looks at what's happening around him. And you can see this happening in Israel right now. There is such a tremendous spiritual awakening in Israel since the 7th of October. People that you never want to hear about Hashem, never want to hear about prayer, never want to hear about 
uh, they, they, all, all of a sudden, it, people are praying and people are opening up books of Psalms and people are looking at Torah and totally non religious soldiers. And all of a sudden, they want tzitzit. They want the they, they want the French garments. It, it's crazy. It's crazy. And then the people they want the wanting kosher. This they've never have you ever thought of being kosher. There's this big spiritual awakening, and this is what Rabbi Nachman is talking about in one fifteen. And he's indicating, hinting, this is a, a prerequisite. In other words, it's a preparation. We can see the red carpet is being rolled out from Shiach. Anyone that's got eyes in his head could see that this is it's all coming down. Uh, we could see the preconditions of Mashiach, which the Gemara lists in Tractate Sota, page 49, the last page in Tractate Sota, one by one, one by one. We elaborated on them last night in a Muna hour. But uh, these are the things who would say, if only read a couple of years ago, that uh, the, the, the settlers in the south are going to go from village, they're going to be homeless, and the Galilee is going to be destroyed. <laughs> you see these things happen right now. Okay, so a person, Rabbi Nachman says, the guy's been walking, a young lady or the guys have been living a, a material life, their whole life, they've been in restaurants and having a good time and going out to movies and, okay, have, having fun. Uh but now they see what's going on around them, and all of a sudden they're enthusiastic. And they say, hey, wait a second. I, I've got a spirit. i got a soul. My soul's waking up. I, 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 I want to look for Hashem. All of a sudden they want to look for Hashem. And people that have came out, they came out of the rave party, and they're the type of people that go to rave party. But then a few people came out alive. The ones I know that came out alive they are looking for a sham. They, they know that it just it's not business as usual. It is not business as usual. If a sham took them out, when 265 of their friends got murdered, and another who knows how many from that rave party were captured and uh, unspeakable crimes, and then you came out alive and waited. And then they see their other friends. There were people in the Gaza area, Kibbutzim. This is one thing, one thing today. I have one of my good friends, Rabbi Moshe Boon and Mintz. He is in charge of the Institute for the Mitzvahs Land of Israel. And he has the, the committee that helps the farmers, that supports the farmers during the sabbatical year, which was this past year. Any farmer, even non-religious, any farmer that kept his fields fallow during the sabbatical year in the Gaza, the, the, the Gaza area settlements, no one, no one was damaged. No one was killed. No one was captured. And the houses are intact. Not only that, out of the 21 settlements that surround Gaza, two of them are officially Sabbath observant settlements. The gate was closed. No one in those two Sabbath observant settlements was, was killed. Okay. People are seeing this. And what's going on? There is a young lady, a young lady, she was captured, captured by Hamas, and she was at that rave party. And she was not exactly modest. And that does you think I don't the exact, exact word I don't want to use these is that, but to take the exact opposite word for modest. Terrorists took her and he took her on foot to Gaza. And she was so scared. And she made a vow. She made a vow, a solemn vow. He said, Shem, if you get me out of this, there's no way out of this. If you get me out of this, I'm going to dress modestly and keep Shabbat. This is here. She didn't never kept it Shabbat, never dressed modestly. They got to Gaza, and the terrorist looked at her and says, go. So well, she was scared. She thought but she's going to let her go, and he's going to shoot her in the back. And she started walking stealthily away, and she turned around, and that's all. She, she, she got away. She got, <laughs> here she is. So now she's keeping her word, and she's publishing this. As they would say, all, all types of stories like this. We hear one by one, by one and I, I heard this morning from the head of Hida Brut, uh, Rabbi Zimmer Cohen, another story about a family that three weeks before the war, they started keeping Shabbat. They made it out. You could see the mitzvot of Hashem, as we spoke in Torah 112, they protect us. They protect us more than we observe. We, we, we protect the Sabbath. The Sabbath protects us more than we observe the mitzvot of Torah, the mitzvot of Torah. They protect us. They observe. They look over us. They just they look at just what you look after them. They look over us. Okay, so now Rabbi Nachman was talking about a situation like that. So here are these people, and they're waking up, and now they want to serve Hashem. Oh, but now the dark side wakes up. You have to understand the evil inclination. 
He's not only tempting, the evil inclination is the accusing lawyer and the heavenly court. The evil inclination, he knows every iota of Torah, every iota of rabbinical law, every iota of uh, rabbinical jurisprudence. And now he comes up and he says, oh, Shem, but that young lady, do you know what she did? Do you know what she did? And do you know what she went to this party and it was Shabbat and it was Simchat Torah and she was dressed like, <laughs> you can't say, you know what? And because she thinks she wants to come back, Hashem, you're going to let her? You're going to let her? She didn't, didn't pay for the price. Oh, the one thing that, now the defense lawyer is going to come in and bring a passage from the Gomorrah Tractate Yuma that when a person makes repentance, makes tshuva out of fear, then his willful sins become accidental sins. But if a person makes tshuva out of love, because he wants to get close to Hashem, he has an awakening of the soul and he feels that he's missing something, he wants to get close to Hashem, then all his or her past sins become merit. They become merit. So one young lady, let's say, okay, the young lady was scared to death. All right, but at the worst case scenario is that her past sins are going to turn into accidental. She wasn't the daughter of some Rosh Hashiva. She wasn't the daughter of, a, of, of the head rabbi of the city. Okay, she grew up in a non-religious home. She grew up in in, in, in Israel. A non-religious home is worse than a non-religious home outside of Israel because it, it, a non-religious homes in Israel are often anti-religious because of the way that the, the old Zionist education. But here she is she's coming back. Okay, so the, the dark side wakes up and it's called Midat the Din, stern judgment. Also, the dark side is also stern judgment because the light side is compassion, it's mercy. These are the defense, every is your, your guardian angel. That's that's from the side. Your guardian angel comes from the side of mercy. That's Hashem's compassion. That's Hashem's name, Yud Kevavke. Your guardian angel comes from him, comes from that side. And whatever you do, your guardian angel is all the time talking good about you and, and, and about your good thoughts. And even if you messed up, but you know, nobody has a party for about transgressing Torah. We make parties when we're sick of doing mitzvahs. When people are transgressing Torah, they're, they're accidental. Okay, so now, now the stern judgment, the power of stern judgment, which is from the left side and the dark left side, is the opposite of mercy. Uh, wakes up and says, well, Hashem, they don't deserve it. And it's in your law. Look what you wrote in the Torah, Hashem. Your law. And it comes to Hashem with your law. Hashem, you got, it can't be that you disdain your own law. You ignore your own laws. You can't let them off the hook. No. Okay? So the dark side doesn't let that person, doesn't give the red carpet to that person to come back to Hashem. And what does the dark side, what does Hashem do? Hashem puts an obstacle in the way. Hashem says, okay, Doc, you're, you're fine. You're fine. So Hashem puts up an obstacle. All right, I'm not going to let them get close to me. Just like I said, okay, you're satisfied? Satisfied. All right. Guess what that obstacle is? Rabbi Nachman's about to tell us. We have, and, and this is very important. This is salient to remember. The obstacle is one big Purim costume, and it's a Hashem. The obstacle that's in your way, that's a Hashem. Hashem is dressed up as a nasty boss. Hashem is dressed up as a nasty neighbor. Hashem is dressed up as something to get in your way, to something to keep you away from Hashem. Uh, for a Noahide, Hashem dresses up as that evangelist family. What do you mean? What do you mean? They're giving you a rough time. What do you mean? You're not going to come home for the holidays. What do you mean? You're not going to eat in our house. What do you mean? What do you mean? What do you mean? Okay. What do you mean that you don't have? What happened to all the, the, the crosses you had in your house? What happened? You know, Noahide family in Alabama. Oh, did they get it? They became Noahides and their family, evangelist, Southern Baptist. They murdered him. In Utah, this is the, uh, the Moore family in Northern Alabama. They took all the crosses out of their house. A week after there was a hurricane in Alabama and that hurricane destroyed their whole town. The hurricane went right up their street and got to the Moore's house and right, it's like a stop sign. That stop and hurricane made a right turn and destroyed the next street on. So you have to think all the houses are torn up and this and that and the Moore's house and, and Mr. Moore was a mechanic, has his own garage and, and the back door has been his garage where he fixes cars and fixes motorcycles. Intact, intact, intact. 
and they just threw out the threw out the other the other stuff. And this is this is what happened. They, they can see. So uh Hashem didn't roll out the red carpet for them. But for years they were there. They decided they want to come back to Shem. So Hashem gave them all this nasty neighbors and nasty family and that's that. And it's just a test. But then they passed that test. They passed that test. And when they passed that test, ooh, right outside of the, they, they got the Shem smile. And then what is the Shem smile? Hashem smiled through the darkness, through the midst of a hurricane. Can you imagine seeing a Shem smile in a hurricane? Everything around this road, not your house, no, because you want to get close to Shem. Shem's going to protect you. The same thing, this is the way the mitzvahs protect you, because when you do a mitzvah, you create a positive spiritual force, which Reb Lezer Ben Yaakov in the fourth chapter of Ethics of the Fathers calls a guardian angel. And that's really a positive, the, the force, what do they call it in Star Wars, the force, positive spiritual force. So now, Rabbi Nachman explains what happens when Hashem, a person wants to get close to Hashem, and Hashem, because of the heavenly court and because of the accusing side, uh, the prosecutors, Hashem has to put an obstacle in the way because the person did do transgressions, even it, but maybe the tshuva wasn't yet full. Maybe the tshuva is just to save his life or to get off the hot seat. Okay, a person all uh, goes to the oncologist and he gets a bad verdict. And uh oh, <laughs> he goes. This is not. This is the dark side. Says, share them. They just want to get off. The, they want to get off of, of death row. They don't want to. Did you? Where were they were last week? And where that? Did, what the Shem? You can see. Hashem knew that that is what it would take to bring them close. The ultimate good in life is proximity to Hashem. That is the ultimate good. That's winning the game here. Okay, and Hashem loves us so much, as Rabbi Nachman is about to tell us, that Hashem does anything to bring us back. And look what Hashem did. I'm talking about all of us in Israel, that there was so much, people are so far away from Hashem, even religious people, because it had, our Torah says you got to love your neighbors yourself. And in religious circles, I'm talking about not secular circles, but so much infighting, so much bickering, so much, oh, not, not now. Not now, we got to pull together. When there's Hezbollah on the northern border and the Houthis on the southern border and uh, the Gaza and Hamas on the, the western border and on the eastern border, a whole boatload of other, of other terrorists. And, it, and now, now it didn't mention that the Jordanian army is doing maneuvers. When the Jordanian army never does maneuvers on a border, they do down the desert. So who knows what's going to be? Oh, and it didn't mention something else that in Judea and Samaria, that the Arabs within Israel, that's every day it's craziness. Every day it's craziness. And that really concerns me more than, than Gaza does. But it, it, it it's crazy. Okay. So now we can see Hashem is putting all this. It, it's all to bring us back. It's all to bring us back. But, but people, if a people look at the obstacles, the difficulties, the challenges, you could get big time stress, big time anxiety. We don't look at the obstacle. We look at Hashem. He's hiding with an obstacle. Now take this, cherish brothers and sisters, axiomatic. Any difficulty in life, that is Hashem. This is Hashem. Okay. Hashem is just hiding himself and don't, don't go away. And this is what, this is the secret that Rabbi Nachman is teaching us in this passage. And Hashem, he loves mercy and loving kindness. So Hashem, Okay, the, the 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 dark side, the accusing side says, "Oh, prosecute him, Hashem." Uh, okay, Hashem says, "Oh, okay, I'm not going to make it easy for him," and he shuts them up and satisfied. Then Hashem himself hides within the obstacle. Hashem himself hides within the difficulty. If you want to find Hashem, look at the difficulty. Okay, Umishu Baldat, Rabbi Nachman says, and someone that has the slightest bit of spiritual awareness, Umistakel Baminia. And he looks at, he or she looks at the obstacle. And there he finds Hashem. If you look hard enough at the obstacle, there you find Hashem. It's not that Hashem has left you. The exact opposite is true. People come along and people say, oh, how can you love Hashem when Hashem took away your loved one? How can you love Hashem when Hashem took away your money? How can you love Hashem when Hashem did this to you? How can you love Hashem when Hashem wounded you in the war? How can you love Hashem when Hashem is attacking with missiles every day? 
That's the exact reason I love Hashem. Because Hashem knows that that's the way I'm going to get close to him. And people that after, once they see that Hashem is there, and people that have had this big suffering in life, and after they're fervently close to Hashem, they weren't so fervently close to Hashem before they had the difficulty. No way. It's just it. But they see that's Hashem. That's Hashem. And not only that, not only that, take family. Okay, visit this. There's plenty of opportunities here in Israel now to uh, visit mourning families, people that lost young soldiers today. Shem in Kom Damam, Shem, we lost a, another two beautiful young soldiers. And you go to a family with Emuna, and yeah, they're crying. Yeah, they're that. Yeah, yeah they're crying. But the, and no, the, the, one family, the son was in commando. And the mother said, I had 21 years of raising my son. And that was for Hashem. That was a free gift. So Hashem decided that the loss of my son has to bring my husband and I and all of Kla Yisrael. I couldn't believe the level of Amuna. This Amuna under fire. And the fervent Amuna, you can't get fervent Amuna, we say all the time, from eating chocolate ice cream. But she's not looking at, at, at the loss of her son. If she look at the loss of her son, she'd be a tranquilizer. She'd be in an hospital. She'd be in tranquilizers. But the woman he, right here in Ashdod, and she's got it all together. She's got all, all together. It, it, it's unbelievable. And, and these are things you see. You see this why King Solomon says, don't go to the pub. Go to the house of a mourner. Because go to the house of a mourner, you get close to Hashem. <laughs> King Solomon says that. Dude, what are you, look, you're not going to find Hashem in the pub. Okay. Uh, but you know why? There's no obstacles in the pub. You go in. Anybody uh, just say, you put a couple of quid on the table. I want a schooner of ale. Nobody's going to bother you. Oh, but you want to get close to Hashem. Ah, uh, the person says. So it's the people come in the outside. So how can you love Hashem when he did this to you? Everything Hashem does to me is out of love. Because the ultimate, 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 and this is what's going to be so embarrassing. After 120 years, we go up to heavenly court and we see the things we complained about, things that thought Shem was giving us at a rough time. That was exactly a Shem bringing us close to him. And don't do this. What we had to learn, Rabbi Nachman is teaching us now, is teaching us now that to save this embarrassment. And that that's the fire. You know what the fire purgatory is? It's not like what they say, you know, this Hades with the, the fire, the oven. Have you ever been embarrassed and you felt like your cheeks are on fire? And get up to the heavenly court and see other things we complained about and see it's all loving kindness, all loving kindness. And I know uh, the Arizal, the Arizal, he tells a story about uh, a mother that lost a young toddler and she cried and she cried and she cried and she cried. And the toddler came to her to, 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 to a dream, said, Mama, why are you crying? If you saw where I was, and if you knew who I was, it was the, the Neshama of a tzaddik. And I was born into a family that uh, I, I grew up in a family. My mother, my previous go-around, my mother, unfortunately, was, was raped by some marauder, uh, some Cossack. And I had to come again into the world to correct my first three years. I was came into the world in unholy circumstances. And mommy, you had the privilege of bringing me in holiness, conceiving me in holiness and bringing me. In. And I finished this way. I need to finish. Now I'm here. Now I'm your protective angel because you carried me in your womb. You gave birth to me. You went through this pain. You raised me for three. Years. That's it. That's what we needed. That's what we need. That's what we needed to be. That's what we see the things. And Shem does everything for the best. And good full love. I just talk about uh, it, it, everything is for the best and, and the, the souls that come back we see things and and then nothing is more painful to us than losing a loved one and yes we have laws of mourning okay we mourn for fallen soldiers we learn mourn for not, nothing i think there's no bigger nightmare than than losing a child i grew up in a family where i was the second and my parents lost my sister she was their oldest child i was 15 she was 17 and uh it, it's it, it's a, something that I, I didn't never see anything more painful, more painful. Okay, so a soldier lose. You know that uh, you, you, there's a, a risk. You're going into war. You're going into battle. But a person just out of the blue comes. But, but it's all for the best. It's all for the best. 
So Rabbi Nachman is telling us that if a person has the slightest bit of spiritual awareness, he or she could see a Shem hidden within that obstacle. Okay, so if somebody says, somebody comes to us and says, where's your God? They said, Rabbi Nachman says, where's your God? Okay, you've got this, you lost your money, you lost your health, you lost your child, where's your God? And you know what you tell him? Rabbi Nachman says, my God is in Aram. Aram is Syria. Or my God is in Seir, Edom. That's the land of the end of Esau. <laughs> in other words, the lowest place on earth. And my God is in the lowest. But where's God? Oh, he's in the lowest place on earth. What's being the lowest place on earth? He's right here within my, right here within my uh, my obstacle, right here within my trouble. And this King David tells us this specifically in Psalm 139. We spoke last night. How King David, by the way, this is Moses talking about the, the passage we're learning, talking about Moses. The two things about Moses and King David, that they are comprised, their souls are the sparks of all our souls. And that's why every soul identifies with King David's Psalms. Okay, and because it's a, the general, that's his Mashiach. And Moses is the leader. Moses is the greatest prophet that ever lived. He's, he's our leader. Okay, Moses is also general sparks. Moses understands every single person, every single person. Moses was a shepherd. He understands his whole flock. Okay, so King David in Psalm 139, he says, I said he would have been bipolar. He says, Imasak Shamaim Shamata, Shem, when I'm flying high, I see you there. Imatsia Sha'ol. Sha'ol is the seventh compartment of purgatory. It's the lowest. He said, all of a sudden, what is he surprised? I'm down so low, sound so down, and everything looks dark and foggy. And there you are, Shem. There you are. King David says it emphatically in Psalm 139. Okay, right there. So we see that the Rabbi Nachman says the obstacle is just like that fog on Mount Sinai where the people, they went away, they're afraid of it. Moses went right into it because Moses was the epitome of spiritual awareness. Moses was, nobody was ever as close to Hashem as Moses was. Moses goes right in to the fog and what happens? Moses spends 40 days and 40 nights with the Shem learning Torah. And he did that three times. So this is the difference between Moses. Moses is the metaphor of spiritual awareness because Moses is the epitome of spiritual awareness. Moses goes right into the fog where the people, oh, the people, they avoid the fog. And this is what Rabbi Nachman is telling us. People see obstacles. Oh, no, they don't want difficulties in life. They want pleasure time. They want leisure time. A uh, path of least resistance. Uh, they want to chill. And say, I spoke to you with my last trip to America. I, I heard two, two, two words. Two words. I learned two words in English, in English slang. Okay, chill and vape. This I heard for young people. They want to chill and they want to vape. This is the thing. They want to vape. They vape. This is the, the vape is their the vapor cigarette. What? That, that's the, when it just hang around to do nothing and consequential. And kids to do something, excel in your learning, excel in sports, to do something and be a musician. But children, no, this is a modern 21st century Western society. Okay, they want to chill and motivate. And it's a people, oh, obstacles? No, we don't want obstacles. We don't want obstacles. They go away from that. Okay, so this is what Rabbi Nachman says. The, he says, not only that, he says, the darkness of the fog. That in biblical and classical Hebrew, the, what we call Lashon HaKodesh, the language of holiness, it's the same root word as darkness. Because when Abraham, uh, when Hashem says to Abraham that he didn't spare his son, okay, Lo Hasachta et Bin Ha, we talk about when, when he put Isaac on the altar, okay, Hasachta is the same word as Choshech, which is darkness. Okay, that's an and hasachta means a an obstacle. An obstacle means darkness. This is uh, Rabbi Nachman. He, he raises, rolls off his tongue. These plays on words and these double and triple and quadruple meanings in Hebrew. And to translate that, it's very interesting because it, you know, English is a language of materiality, whereas biblical Hebrew is a language of spirituality. It's all spirituality. Okay, so this is what they say, and it. it, it an obstacle corresponds to a dark cloud, to mist, to fog. It's something, what's the, what's the dark cloud, the mist, the fog? It's something in darkness where we can't see properly, where we can't, we don't have clarity, we lack clarity. 
and we don't know what to do. And people like to have, you know, we're all basically control freaks. You know, we like to control situations and this would it be, and I'm going to wake up and I'm going to do this. There's an expression in Yiddish. Nothing makes Hashem laugh more than our plans. Okay, then the plans we make, Hashem cracks up. <laughs> you plan to do this, and that's really funny. No, that's not in the script today. That's not in the script of your life. Okay, so what happens? Moses, who is the spiritual awareness, understands the, the advantage of the, the, the fog. He goes right into the fog where people, the, 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 are, the nation in general, Ha'am, the people go away from the fog, and they keep their distance. But that's not Moses. Moses goes right into the thickness. And because why does Moses do it? Rabbi Nachman explains. And this is what Moses said. Look what, look what the passage says. Moses goes into the fog because there is God. In the fog, there is God. That's exactly what it was. He knew that inside the fog, there's God. The Shem is not, oh, here I am. Night in the clear weather. No, Hashem's in the fog. Hashem is in the darkness. That's where he hide was. And that's where Hashem concealed himself. Now, this is what Rabbi Nachman says. Now, Rabbi Natan picks up the ball of Torah 115. And Rabbi Natan elaborates on what Rabbi Nachman says. Rabbi Natan, this is now Rabbi Natan speaking. And we also heard about this. Mipiva Kadosh from Rabbi Nachman's holy mouth. Shehosif Leverinyan that Rabbi Nachman continued to elaborate on this. That Hashem himself hides within the obstacle. And he said like this, Hashem Hashem loves justice. But there's one thing that Hashem loves more than justice. Cherish brothers and sisters. Hashem loves us more than he loves justice. So Hashem doesn't want to hit us with a book, even though he wrote the book. Hashem wrote the book of justice, but we messed up. Okay, we were doing 80 miles an hour in a 55 mile an hour zone. Okay, and according to just, justice says, uh, you got uh, uh, maybe suspension, uh, you know, conditional suspension and for take it for it, uh, for points on your license and you're going to pay $400 fine. Okay, that's what's written in the books. But uh, Hashem hides in some obstacle to bring us closer to him. Hashem wants to love us more than he wants to throw the book at us. People think that Hashem is tormenting us. The challenges that Hashem gives us is love. It's all love. And you can understand it. Any soldier understands or any champion athlete understands. I don't think that there are many people that have more difficult lives than soldiers in elite units and champion athletes. Because if you're a champion athlete, you got a good coach, coach murders you, murders you. And, 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 and with even a, a, a difficult workout, you have a commander, a good commander, and especially a, in one of the training courses with basic training or advanced infantry training or NCO school or officer school, a good drill instructor kills you. It kills you. And he said, why are, you, why are you so mean? Why are you so mean? You know what a commander's worst nightmare is? Commander's worst nightmare is to come and tell the family, knock on the family's door, and to tell them that their son's not coming home. Commander says, I never want to do that. So I'm going to kick your elbow. Okay? I'm going to have it kick it hard. All right? And you're going to have a... A, a painful elbow, okay? Excuse me, let's keep it clean. But you're going to come home safely. You're going to come safe. You're going to have bruises. Okay, that's fine. You come home with bruises and you come home crying and complaining, but you're going to come home to mom and dad and you're going to come home to your wifey and you come home to the kids. That's it. That's what we want. This is what Hashem wants to bring us home after 120 years of pitched battle with evil inclination. This world is not comfort zone. This world, and people are looking for the comfort zone, forget about it, because we can't get close to a sham and comfort zone. This world is challenge after challenge after challenge, and, and, and that's it. And so when the challenges stop, the challenges stop when, instead of looking down at the grass, we look up at the grass, that's when the challenges stop. Okay, but people don't accept that. 
and they want this easy life. It's like uh, little Mikey wants his chocolate toffee. For little Mikey wants chocolate toffee and crying. Mom knows it's not good for him. That if he gets chocolate toffee, he's going to have two holes after you know, 50 years down the road, a hole in his mouth and a hole in his pocket. So you can't have toffee. Oh, mommy, you mean? You can't have, what do you mean? Okay, but she lets that toffee. He's going to get fat. He's going to have bad, bad teeth. Hashem doesn't want to give us fat city because it's not good for us. We get fat. The Torah says, Vayishman Yeshurun Vivat. And Yeshurun, which is a metaphor for us, <laughs> he gets fat, get away from Hashem. See, a person has all the money in the world and all the health in the world and all the power in the world, all the fame. He doesn't need Hashem. He thinks he's the big man on the campus and the big lady on the campus. That's not good because Hashem says he and the arrogant person cannot dwell in the same universe. So Hashem gives us challenges. He puts fog in our life to make things not so clear where we can't function on our own, where we need Hashem's help. But not only do we not run away from the fog, we run into the fog. We run into the fog because Hashem, he loves us. And that's Hashem hiding in the fog to bring us close to us. And especially when a person wants to get close to Hashem or wants to get to get close to a true tzaddik, oh, you're going to get uh, you're going to get big opposition on the field because the dark side doesn't want that. The dark side, that's why you learn in Muna and learn Bitochan, you're going to get big, 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 big Shem is good. the dark side is going to give you every reason to show you that Shem's not there. I know people, and I see people right here with us, people right here with us tonight. And they've been strength themselves in Amuna, and the guy's got a, a good business. And all of a sudden, when he's really making headway, and, and I, I can attest to his headway, boom, his business is suffering a setback one after the other, and a and test of his income, and th- this is a shem. This is a shem. This is a shem test. And when he passed that test, he's going to go through, and he's going to make triple. It'll be, it'll be triple successful. But just got to hold on. Got to hold on with the muna. And this is what the spiritual awareness of Moses. That's where we plug into the Moses of our generation, and to get from him spiritual awareness. And that's why when you pick a spiritual guide, people ask me, "How do you pick a spiritual guide?" I say, "Ask who your spiritual guide. Spiritual guide is because a person. There's only one Moses." And we have a hierarchy where he connected to student, to teacher, student, to teacher, student, teacher, all the way back up to Moses. Okay, so Hashem has to agree with the laws that he created in the Torah. And Hashem, it looks like, apparently Hashem is throwing the book at us, but Hashem is right there within the punishment. Hashem loves justice, but he loves us more than he loves justice. So Rabbi Natan continues, and because Hashem loves us so much, and Hashem's love for us is greater than his love for justice. Hashem has to, Hashem has to appear himself. He's the, he's the, the supreme judge. And he has to agree with the jurisprudence. It's right out, of the, right out of the Torah. The accusing angels right out of the Torah. But what Hashem does is then hides within the challenge, within the fog, within the punishment. Hashem agrees, okay, he says, are you satisfied? Are you satisfied? I'll take care. I'll take care. No, this is uh, not proper punishment. I'll give a punishment that's just as equal. Just, Hashem gives us a punishment. He knows we can handle, but it's not a punishment. What looks like a punishment, <coughs> excuse me, is a ploy to bring us close to him because Hashem loves us so much. But Hashem pulls the wool over the eyes of the accusing angels, and they think, oh, look, Hashem. Yeah, Hashem's getting a rough time. Oh, you got a sickness? Yeah, I got a sickness. Lost money? Yes, lost money. Uh, lost a loved one? Lost a loved one. <laughs> That's a shem. That's a shem right there. That's a shem right there to bring us close to us. So Rebbe Natan continues on, and Rebbe Natan says, Al Cain, and therefore, Hashem Yidbarach Noten Rashut Lazmin Lo and because of Hashem's laws of justice, he has to give the, he gives permission to obstacles to enter our life. But those obstacles enter our life, and like everything else, he alone did, does, and will do. First thing, a principle. Shem said, okay, obstacle, you could come. But Hashem is now, that obstacle is nothing. That obstacle is nothing. Hashem activates the obstacle, and Hashem is the engine within that obstacle. Hashem is the obstacle. It's one big costume party. That's Hashem hiding as the obstacle. Okay. Hashem must steal it, that's more. This is what Rabbi Nahum says. It's Hashem hiding within that obstacle. And anyone that has spiritual awareness can find Hashem 
within the obstacle. So because of your obstacle, you've done one thing. Maybe you've started keeping Sabbath. Maybe started praying. Maybe started doing personal prayer. Maybe started keeping Psalms. All because of the obstacle. That would have never happened because of the obstacle. So you turn around and all of a sudden, the obstacle is not there anymore. Well, people say to me, oh, what do you mean the obstacle is not there? My lost child, my 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 martyred son, from Bavre, he, he's not back here. Hold it. Hold it. Let's see what happens when Mashiach comes and after Mashiach's arrival of the dead. And, and then let, let's hear you complaining. Let's hear you complain when, when Johnny comes marching home again. Okay. Let, let, let's hear you complain then. All right. You have to know, have to hold on patiently that we, with our flesh and blood eyes and our flesh and blood brain, we don't understand a thing. Okay. But that's a sham hiding within that obstacle. And that's why we don't have to be afraid. We go into battle, we go into the fog. Because in the fog, that's where Hashem is. And that's what Rabbi Nachman teaching, teaching us in Bull Hashem. That's Torah 115, completely. Okay, beloved brothers and sisters, don't be afraid of the obstacle. That's Hashem right there with you. And it's just Hashem wants us to bring him. Hashem wants us to get closer to him. Okay, God bless. We share good news from each other.